Good morning. Good morning. Awesome to see you guys. Welcome back home. Um, wow, I'm, I'm really blessed that so many people showed up early. I, I honestly, I can't, I understand the different explanations for why we do this, but really what it comes down to is you know, just one day a year I like to get up and punch myself in the face. <laughs> That's really what it feels like. I mean, last night, we're getting ready for bed at 8 o'clock. Oh, that just galls me. Um, I haven't asked the pastor a question. Actually, I've got several, but I'm only going to touch one today. Um, the question is, I'm, I'm going to read it. It's a little bit long. Um, why do most of the newer Bible translations omit... 1 John 5, 7. In the King James, it says, for, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Other translations omit this Trinity verse completely and move the first part of verse 8 up to where verse 7 was. Why would they take out the only verse that directly says that those three are one? Anybody here have the King James Bible? Yeah. Flip over to 1 John chapter 5. Everybody flip there. 1 John chapter 5. Okay, I'm going to read it out of the ESV. Um, we're going to just read verse 7 and 8 together. They're, they're two of one thought. It says, For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Now, uh, Deb, would you go ahead and read that in the King James? Five through seven. Uh, chapter 5, 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Okay. Anybody see the dilemma? Yeah. Uh, the newer translations, by newer translations, we're, we're talking about uh, like the NASB, the ESV, the NIV, uh, translations that were done uh, within the last century, okay? Uh, King James was originally written in 1611. Um, then New King James, actually New King James would be considered a newer translation. Does anybody have the New King James? Was that King James or New King James? It's a new, the, the New King James, okay. King James and the New King James read the same way in those two verses, okay? You have the New American Standard? Read it for me. I think that's the new one. Isn't it? Yeah. Read it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mom. <laughs> so we have these things, these three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Okay. This is what's known in theological circles as the comma johannium or that's Latin and Greek, it's the comma Johanni. Uh, what that means is, is the clause of John. Not like Santa Claus, John Clause. It's, it's, it's a clause, it's just a short fragment of a sentence. Um, the reason that the newer translations do not have verse 7 as it reads in the King James is because in 4,000 manuscripts that we have, only four read the way the King James does. And none of them are in the earliest translations. Uh, as a matter of fact, up until Jerome translated the Vulgate, we didn't really see any of them. Up to that point, there was only one reference to the way that the King James reads. Um, now, when the authors of the King James were writing, the, the, the translators, not the authors, because that would be God. Um, but when the translators were rendering it into the English, 
they used translations that were based off of the writings of Erasmus from 15, uh, it's about 1516 AD. Now Erasmus, if you, if you know your church history, 1516 AD was right at the start of the Reformation. And Erasmus was a staunch proponent for the Catholic Church. He uh, actually was, was vehemently opposed to um, Martin Luther. He felt like Martin Luther was violating the, the sanctity of, of God's word by, by rewriting, uh, by, by basically confronting the sin in the church and then by separating himself out from the church. Um, he was also opposed to Zwingli, the, the uh, Swedish translator that, that uh, kind of brought in some humanistic ideas such as free will into the understanding of scripture. Um, Erasmus, he wrote his first New Testament, uh, was released in 1516. The second one was released in 1520. Neither of those vision, versions contained 1 John 5, 7, the, the Johannine, or the comma Johannine. Um, you need to understand Erasmus is working off of manuscripts that were available at the time. Um, a lot of people say that he used the Codex Recepticus. Uh, that's not true. The Codex Recepticus didn't come out till four years after his first, uh, vision, first vision, first release of the New Testament. Um, he was supported, he was given permission to do this translation by Pope Leo. Okay? That was his sponsor for writing the, the translation. Now, keep in mind, in Europe at this time, the church was involved in everything. Everything. From politics on down. As a matter of fact, one of the things that the uh, Reformation did was it actually started breaking apart the, the hold that the church had on the political and social leaders of the day. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think there's pros and cons in both camps. Um, but at this point in time, if the church said no, you didn't do it. Okay. Erasmus was given permission to translate from the Pope, from the church, from the highest echelons in the church. And when he did his first two versions of the, his translation, the church was very upset with him. As a matter of fact, after uh, 1520, he was actually brought up before a council of the church because he had left the, the Kama Johanni out of his translation. And his answer to them, and, and you can look this up, there's uh, actually records of the, 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 I won't say trial, because it wasn't really a trial, it was more of an interrogation, where they're, they're questioning him. Um, he said, I have found no translations where this clause is used. I have found no manuscripts where this, the Johannine comma, is used. And he said, therefore, I haven't put it in. Well, the, the church brought one, one manuscript, and it, was a, it wasn't actually the original manuscript, it was a rendition of the, the manuscript that had been translated in 1510 that used the comma Johanni. And essentially, they put pressure on him to put that into his translation. Now, jump ahead half a, de half a century, 1611. The authors of the King James Bible are kind of operating in the same sense in that they are being sponsored by, does anybody know? King James. King James, right there in the title. Um, and and they're, they're, you know, when you have to appease certain people, you're putting your integrity at risk. Okay, um, it's very interesting to note in the King James original, uh, first let me tell you right now, if you're reading King James today, you're not reading the original, 
okay? The, the, the version that we have today, whether you're, I'm not even talking about New King James, I'm talking about King James, has been reworked numerous times. Uh, if you were to have an original King James Bible today, first, it would be worth a lot of money. <laughs> Second, you probably wouldn't understand it, okay? Because the, the form of English that they used then is radically different than what we use today. All right, so in 1611, in the side notes, in 40 some times, as the authors are, or the, see, I keep saying authors, translators are, are translating this across, they make notes onto problematic verses. They were working off of a limited scope of manuscripts. It actually, in the foreword, they actually mentioned that it was their hope that as the manuscripts became available to them, they'd be able to resolve some of these questionable issues in some of these passages. Okay, 1611, this working off of the original Erasmus text and then jumping forward to the, um, oh, it's there, but it won't come to my brain. It was actually a French translation that was done a little bit later, 1550. Um, Ennis translation, um, they opted to keep that passage in there because it was in two of the, the works that they were drawing from. Okay, now, NASB, NIV, uh, ESV, a lot of what we call the newer translations do not have it in there because it is not in the earliest manuscripts that we have. Now when you're translating, if, if you're looking to prove the veracity and the authenticity of a script, there's two things that we look at, okay? Uh, the first thing that you look at is the number of manuscripts that you have available to you. And this is one of those things that's absolutely incredible about God's Word, okay? Because we have in excess of 4,000 manuscripts and if you take manuscript fragments, we have more than 50,000 manuscripts to work from, okay? If, if you count the fragments as well as, as the, the, the full passages. We have 4,000. The next closest one, as far as number of manuscripts, is I believe it's Homer. And, and that, I think, is right around 500, okay? So you, you look at these and you compare them to each other. Now here's the, the, the trick. If you look at 10 manuscripts and nine of them read this way and the 10th one is a little different, which is wrong? The 10th one, okay? And, and we're not even looking on that small of a scale. We're looking at, of the 4,000, we only had four. That, that read with the comma Johanni, all right? Now the second thing that you're looking at, besides the number of manuscripts that, that gives you, helps you be able to narrow in on what was really in the original, because we don't have the originals, okay? Um, we don't have them, and a lot of people that like to question the Bible, the authenticity of the Bible, they point their finger and they say, aha, you don't even have the original writings. We don't have the original writings for for Homer, for Aristotle, for um, Pliny, for Tacitus. We, we don't have the original writings for any of these. We have manuscripts, copies of the original writings. Okay? Nobody questions Homer. Nobody questions the authenticity of, of Tacitus. Nobody questions the writings, the authenticity of Caesar. Um, but they question the Bible. That's why I think it's so amazing that we have 4,000 manuscripts, okay? The second thing you want to look at is how close the manuscripts are to the original, all right? And that's significant because the closer they are to the original, the better you're, you're going to get without getting author's notes, um, typos, okay? Where, where they, they mistranslate something or accidentally leave a letter out or or change a name or a location or something like that. So the closer you get to it, the better it is. Now, in these 4,000 manuscripts, we have manuscripts that are between 30 and 60 years apart from the original. Okay? That's incredible. When you consider the dating of this, it's incredible how close it is to the original. All right? 
the, the next closest one, I think, I think Homer uh, is at least 600 years between the original manuscript and the, the, or the original document and the manuscript we have today. It's about 600 years. And, and nobody questions that. All, all the scholars are like, oh yeah, I mean, that's as close as we're ever going to get. That's as close to what it was as we'll get. But the Bible, everybody questions. So when you look at the translating of the Bible, because it's not a one-for-one one deal. There's not just a word in, in a one language that you can just push across to the other language and have it understood in the same way. For example, um, does anybody know what the word pneuma in Greek means? When? <laughs> See, there's our problem. Thank you guys for demonstrating. In the Hebrew, it's ruach. Does anybody know what ruach means? Spirit. Spirit. Or breath. Or wind. So here, here we have a dilemma. How do we know which word to put into the English when we see in the original language ruach or pneuma? How do we know? I'll, I'll complicate things even further. Let's just stick with pneuma for right now, okay? Let's just stick for pneuma. Pneuma, literally translated, means wind. But by connotation, it means spirit, okay? So how do we know which word the author intended when we're translating? Context. Context. Context is everything. But now we have another problem. Because if you look in your Bible, most of your Bibles are going to have spirit in some places with a little s and in other places with a big s. Why? Well, because the little s is referring to the profane, the common spirit, and the big s is referring to the person, Holy Spirit. All right? So how do we know whether it's the big s or the little s? Again, Context is everything. How is it being used in the phrase that's given? Okay, and then we, then we, now see, here's where we get real messed up. We, because our language is lousy. It's a horrible language. It's, it's got parts from, from Latin. It's got parts from German. It's got parts from French. It's, 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 it's got parts from Old English. And we just stuck them all in willy-nilly and said, this is our language. And then we teach it in school. And the teachers don't understand why it works the way that it does. It just does. I before E, except after C, and in other cases where I will mark you off if you get it wrong. <laughs> and that's how it works. Okay? But we take this and we start appending things that are important to our language. For example, articles. Anybody know what an article is in, in English? The A. Yeah, it's all those words that we can't stick anywhere else. You know, it describes what is going on. So if you say man, you, you usually put a in front of it to indicate that it is a... Now, why we do that, I don't know, because man is singular anyway. But we put an a in front of it just to make more... Sp and I know what happens. Students, when the teacher said, I need two pages, they started sticking in all these words that don't mean anything or absolutely unnecessary, so they get the full two pages. I did it all the time, you know. <coughs> and if you didn't, you should have. <laughs> so now we have this language because Greek does not use articles that we have to try and render into something that's meaningful to us. So now we don't even have a problem with just the particular word we're translating. Now we have a problem with trying to get the idea into something we can comprehend, okay? So that, that complicates things even further. Now, as to the, the comma Johanni, Johannium, is this a problem? Does the fact that the King James has it in there and the NASB does not have it in there, is that a problem? It really isn't. It really isn't. Because the rest of Scripture clearly supports and, and teaches the idea, the understanding of a triune God, okay? If you want to uh, dig into that a little bit more, uh, there are a number of books. I would recommend that you read uh, Nino Kalischer's Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures 
There are copies in the library. It's, it's not a very long book, but it gives you tons of information. Okay? Um, so having these verses in there may be a little bit dishonest in that it's in such few manuscripts compared to it not being in there, but does it change the story? Does it affect the story? Does it affect what God is telling us? It really doesn't. Because we can look in other places and see that the three are one. When Jesus tells us, he gives us a great commission. Whose name are we to baptize in? There you go. And we can point out to numerous scriptures where the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So this really doesn't complicate things for us. Yeah, somebody wants to get all nitpicky and say, Aha! You can't trust it! It's not changing the story at all. You know? And maybe if they'd stuck something in there about, you know, the Father, the Son, and Baal, the three are one, then we'd go, Uh-oh! Uh -oh. Yeah, because see, that completely flies in the face of the continuity of all Scripture. Okay? Because remember, with... 40 different authors writing, there was really only one author. Okay? He used, he used the context and, and their language, but he put in there exactly what he wanted in there. There's nothing in there that's frivolous. We say, okay, well, if that's not in there, why is it, why? why? Uh, well, because some people put it in. It doesn't affect the story, folks. It doesn't affect what God is telling us. It does not contradict anything in the Word. Okay, so I don't know who wrote that, but awesome question. Very cool. I will leave it up front with a little bit more reference material in my answer. Um, so, we are in the season of what? Lent. Lent. We are moving into um, our holiest week of the year. Um, I want to walk us on a little bit of a journey. Um, this, this month is, is planned out such that we are going to move through the last week, a little bit more, last couple weeks of Jesus' life. We're going to kind of walk along the path that he walked. We're going to visit Jericho. Um, we're we're going to touch a little bit on Samaria as Jesus came out of uh, the Galilee area and he came down and, and he was moving to Jerusalem for his encounter with what he had been created to do. Uh, he visited in Jericho. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. He went over to Bethany and he spent some time there and, and one of his greatest miracles uh, was performed there. And, and then he moved up over to the Mount of Olives and, and passed down the Mount of Olives coming into Jerusalem. And then we're going to spend some time building up to that point because um, in the next few Sundays in our series, we're going to talk about as he's moving along what's going on. We're going to bring this thing up to uh, Palm Sunday as Jesus enters into Jerusalem on the Lamb Selection Day. And, and then that's going to move us into Good Friday, which, which the church... Uh, the, the Church of the Reformation calls it Good Friday because we look back on that as, as the day that, that uh, uh, was significant um, to us because that's when Jesus went to the cross. That's when the price was paid for our sin. Okay, And, and we're going to look at the Passover and the Seder. If you have not been to our Seder, I encourage you to come to the Seder. We show Jesus in the Passover. Okay, God put these things in place for the Jews to, to be able to understand what was going on. He spoke prophetically. We looked at this in the Feast of Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And we saw how Jesus came and literally fulfilled these, these prophetic commands that God had given to Israel. And, but, but the Seder dinner, um, even beyond that, the, the Jews are the people of God. Okay? And they do things without understanding why, and, and God uses that to illustrate to them. For example, every, every uh, first Sunday, we celebrate communion, and, and we use the matzah, the unleavened bread. But, but in the Seder, they, they rabbis required that the bread 
be both striped and pierced. Now, they have their human reasoning why this is so, and there are scriptures to support this, but that is a huge illustration of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who was both striped and pierced. He was scourged, he was whipped, and then he was pierced with the nails. So, I would encourage you, if you have not been, come to one. And, and this year, you actually you, you can go to one of two. Because we're doing it here at Jesus Community Church, and Dennis and Jeannie have been invited to do it down at Crossroads Community Church? Just Crossroads. Crossroads. Okay, down off of Sheathman Creek. Uh, so there will be two of them actually going on the same night. Um, so I would encourage you, if you have not been, sign up to come. If you have been, come anyway. It's a beautiful celebration. All right? So... <clears throat> In this journey, we're going to get to Passover, the Seder. We'll go Palm Sunday and then to Passover. And then Passover, we're going to tie that straight into the Feast of First Fruits, Resurrection Sunday. And that will be Easter Sunday. Okay? And, and that's going to pick up right where the Seder left off. And then we're going to walk through the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection. Okay, so I would encourage you, start looking at the last couple weeks of Jesus' life, okay? In, in the uh, Synoptic Gospels, um, they, they give a few chapters. Uh, the Gospel of John, he dedicates the majority of his book to the last few weeks of Jesus' life, okay? So start digging into that. But one of the things that we, what I want to talk about today is let's, let's start at the beginning, Okay, because when did this thing start? When God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> Actually before that. Because from the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. Okay? You want to look with amazement on our God. Before earth was created, before man came to be, God knew we were going to blow it. I don't know about you guys, but I, man, if I'm going to blow it, if it's going to get ruined, I don't want to even start. What's the point? What's, why bother? And yet God knowing that it, it wasn't even going to take a lot of us, it only took two. One rule, two people, okay? And, and we, you know, um, we wouldn't have done any better. We, we wouldn't have done any better, okay? God knew that this was going to happen. He knew sin was going to come in, that man would fall, man would be separated from him, that man would need a way to be restored to a right relationship with God. Now think about this for a minute. A right relationship with God. We don't even understand the concept of what life would be like without sin. Because even though we stand righteous before God, we're still growing. We're still maturing. We're, we're still finding areas that, that God looks at as sin and we're like, wow, I didn't even know that was a problem. Okay? And, and we're maturing and, and we're being perfected. We're already made holy. We're as holy as we will ever be because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But now we got to live it out. It's, it's got to be worked out in our lives. Okay? So, um, God knew we would need a way. And a plan was put into place. Now, I want to look at a number of scriptures. And, and normally I don't like to do this. I like to teach expositionally where we take a passage of scripture and we work through that passage. But today we're going to... We're gonna, um, we're going to grasshopper around a little bit. We're going to kind of jump around a little bit. And I'm doing that on purpose because I want you to see that all throughout God's word, there is a divine plan in play. Okay? It's, it's not a bunch of random events that just came together in a happy coincidence that brought us salvation. It's all a part of a specific plan. So let's, let's take a look at a couple of passages. The first thing that I want to start with um, 
I'm going to start in Luke chapter 9. So go ahead and flip over there. So Jesus is, is going through his ministry. At this point, he is up in the, the Galilee area. Uh, he is ministering. He's doing what he's done through the entirety of his ministry. He's, he's teaching. He's healing. He's doing miraculous things. He's speaking the truth to people. And he's, he's going from place to place. Okay? And... Leading up to, I'm going to start in verse 51, but leading up to this, um, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to die. Um, if you look back in verse 45, now, see, we look, we, we read looking back on something that's already been done, and we oftentimes read with a great deal of judgment, especially those poor apostles, because, you know, um, I'm going to back up to, to uh, 43. It says, And all were astonished at the majesty of God, but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. Okay, that, that's kind of like when, when your, your mom or your dad says, Pay attention. Okay? Okay. Um, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying. Now, right there, you know, a lot of times I, 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 when I'm going through and I'm reading through the Gospels and I'm reading through the life of Jesus, I get frustrated with how often the disciples just didn't get it. And, and the focus of all of this is Peter. Uh, man, I, I really, I feel bad for Peter sometimes. Because all the other disciples knew how to play him. Hey, Pete, why don't you ask him this? <laughs> Go ask Pete. He does everything. You know, he's, he's, and, and he's always the one that Jesus is like, oh, really? Really? Guys, really? You sent him to ask this? Come on. Okay? But, but listen to what's going on here. Okay? But they did not understand this saying. Why? And it was concealed from them, so they might not perceive it. God was unveiling his plan, not so they would look forward with understanding, but so we would look back with understanding. Okay? When Jesus went to the cross the, the night before in Gethsemane, the, the disciples didn't get it. I mean, they had just celebrated. Jesus had come in with the, the, the crowds and the thongs yelling and, and cheering and shouting. They just celebrated the, the Passover meal. They went out singing. As far as they know, man, things are clicking along just like they always have. I mean, all the other times they came into Jerusalem, nobody was cheering. But this time they're cheering. We got it, man. We're close. We are on the cusp. Wow, that was a lot of wine. I'm tired. They didn't get it, okay? But they, it was concealed from them. Not because, it was because they weren't supposed to be looking forward with understanding. They were supposed to look back with understanding, okay? So, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, but they did not understand. It was concealed from them, okay? And then, and then, and then we see really how the disciples were. All right, look down there in verse 46. You, you know, I, our kids, I was going to say our kids did this. They still do this. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Well, they don't argue about which one of them is the greatest. They argue about which one mom loves more. <laughs> She's got them all convinced that she loves them the most. I don't struggle with that. I don't worry about that. They, they worry about who mom loves the most. 
Never once did any of them wonder about who dad loved the most. I don't like any of them. If I didn't love your mom, you guys would not be here. All right? You are a byproduct of my love for your mom. Okay? I tolerate you. Okay? There was never a question as, ha, huh, dad loves me more. I kept them wondering if I even liked them. All right? That's not true. All my kids know I love them. <coughs> they just don't know which one I love the most. Okay, so they get into this. Hey, which one was the greatest? But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. And he said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you is the one who is great. Okay? So, so we, we see what's going on here. I mean, basically, it's the same thing that had been going on throughout Jesus' ministry. Okay? He would teach them something they wouldn't understand. He would have to explain. Okay? But then look down here. Verse 49. Okay, now at, at this point... The disciples had been with him for, for approximately three years. Okay? And he's already sent them out. He sent out the 72. He sent out the 12. They come back rejoicing because even the demons obeyed them. The, the miraculous signs that they saw. And had, what did Jesus say? He says, don't rejoice in this. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Okay? But... but Three years has gone by, and, and they're arguing about, oh, yeah, hey, man, I sit closest to Jesus at the table. I, I'm great, man. And then, and then John, okay, does anybody know what James and John were called, the, the title that was given to them? Sons of Thunder. The Sons of Thunder. My mom used to call my brother and I the Sons of Thunder. Um, I don't know why. He's the one that always did everything. <laughs> It was like Son of Thunder and his brother. <laughs> um, but, but look at this, John. All right, John answered. He said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. Think about this for a moment. All right? It doesn't say this man was attempting to cast out demons. It says he was casting out demons. And they're stopping him. What, what really were they concerned about? Because it's obvious they weren't concerned about the, the poor fellow that was, yeah. was struggling, was afflicted. What were they concerned about? They were, they were concerned about their position. I mean, they're already arguing about who's the greatest. This guy's not even one of us. He's not even a contender for greatest. And he's stepping on our turf. All right? But then, then let's look a little bit further down here. Okay, so we see all this stuff that's going on. Verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, we have to understand, and I'm, I'm going to hit a couple of other scriptures here in just a minute. We have to understand that God has a plan. He has a time in which things will be done. Okay? In Galatians it tells us that... Actually, let's, let's look at this because there's a couple differences in the way it reads. Um, excuse me. Galatians chapter 4. Flip there with me real quick. Keep your finger under Luke. Okay, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> okay, Galatians chapter 4. Paul is writing to the Galatians. He's talking about um, the, the, he's, he's focusing on the issue of the law and grace. And so he comes to this place. Um, in verse 4, 
That's where I'm going to pick up. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Okay, that word sons there, that's that same word, use of the word adelphoi, which, which means sons and daughters. Okay, it's not just, it's not a male specific thing, although it would be used as a male specific thing if they were speaking specifically. But Paul isn't, remember, context is everything. In this case, because he's not addressing a specific group of people, it's sons and daughters. Okay, so women don't look at that and get all up in a tizzy. Well, why do they get all the good stuff? All right, it's all of us. But also keep in mind when, when he's using that phrase as it comes to responsibility and accountability, you're included in that too. Okay, so here we go. Um, verse 4, uh, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And then in verse 6, and because you are sins, God has sent His Spirit, uh, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Okay, that's, that's just a cool passage right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul is speaking out very plainly to us what we were and what we are. And when, when Christ came, he took us from being slaves. Now, that's the whole thing about redemption is, is he paid our slave price and bought us out of bondage into freedom. And, and when that thing came out and, and, and we didn't just come from slavery into freedom, we, we came from slavery into sonship, to being the children of God. And, and then it's his spirit that bears witness in us that allows us to call out, Abba, Father. Now, I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it. Everybody likes to say, oh, we're all God's children. That's not true. It's not according to the Bible. John chapter 1, to them that believed, he gave the right to be called the children of God. Okay? So we're all creations. We're all his creations, but only those that believe are his children. All right, but back up here to verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, um, somebody, you have the NASB. Would you read that for me again real quick? Just that phrase in verse 4. But when the light, excuse me, when the right time came, God sent his son for the woman. Okay, but the right time. Uh, somebody have the NIV? Somebody have the NIV? Uh, Ken, would you read the NIV? When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Okay, that's good. Good. Hold on right there. Okay, that first clause in there. Okay. But when the fullness of time had come, when the time was right, okay, now, I don't know what God was looking for, for the time to be right. Um, you know, at Christmas, I always like to share the preparation that went into the birth of Jesus Christ. Because God was getting the world ready to receive his son. And, and we talked about, you know, the Pax Romana. We talked about the Via Romana. We talked about... Uh, um, the, the unified language in, in the known world. We've talked about how God put all these things in place so that when his son came, the message could go out with great ease. And, and you could go from Jerusalem all the way around to Hispania or all the way the other direction over into Libya and you could share the gospel in a language that could be understood. Okay, And, and the peace of Rome pretty much guaranteed so you get there mostly safe. Okay, so when the time was right, I don't know what God was looking for. I don't know what, what were the criterion that he set before the time was right, but we do know the time was right. Okay, so we know from Revelation that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. We know that at that time, God already knew all who were going to be his. Okay, and we knew that God was looking for something for the time to be right, and when it was right, he sent his son. Okay? So, where did this thing begin? It began before the beginning. Our beginning. Okay? Um, now, uh, 
John chapter 12, Jesus says something kind of interesting. We all know about the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When Jesus went in and, and they just celebrated Passover and, and he took uh, James and John and Peter and, and they went a little bit further into the garden and then he said, uh, watch with me. Okay, and then he went off a little bit further and, and, and he travailed. And, you know, I, I think it's Luke says that he was so distraught that his sweat was his blood. Um, that is an actual medical condition that, that occurs that under cases of extreme anxiety, you, you can actually sweat blood. Um, so we knew, uh, we know that he was under extreme anxiety. Um, we, we know that he called out to God, if it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. And, and we know even in the midst of his, his anxiety, his, his fear, his, uh, you know, and, and that's his humanity. Okay, because as God, he knows what's going to happen, and we'll see that in just a minute. But his humanity, man, I don't know about you guys, but I don't look forward to getting hurt. I, I don't look forward to when, when things are, are going to go poorly for me, especially physically. And, and so I understand, he was distraught. But did you know that he was concerned about that even before this point? It was John uh, chapter 12. I'll just read it to you real quick. Don't have to turn there. John chapter 12, verse 27. Uh, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. You see, Jesus came knowing. Now, we can get into all kinds of philosophical and theological discussions as to when Jesus know, knew who he would, you know. Did, did he know from birth? Did it come in, uh, you know, about 12 when he became a man? Did it happen sometime before that? Did it happen sometime after that? Did it happen sometime right before the start of his ministry? Doesn't matter. Does not matter in the least. Because he knew now. Okay? He knew soon enough to go to the cross. He came for the purpose of restoring that relationship between God and man, to reconcile to God all of mankind. Okay? And think about this for a moment. He went through his life knowing what the end was going to be like. I mean, you know, I don't know how many of you know what your end is going to be like. I don't know what my end is going to be like. Okay? I hope it's quick. Because I don't like pain. Okay? But Jesus knew what it was going to be like. All right? So he says, you know, what, what shall I say? You know, it, it's for this purpose that I've come. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to wrap up with this. There's, there's two things that I, I want to say real quick. <clears throat> Chapter 12 picks up right after the Hall of Faith where the writer of Hebrews is going through and he's listing all of the great faith warriors. And he picks up in, in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, therefore, because of all of these things that he has just talked about, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, I, I don't know how things work, you know, after things are done here. I, I do know this, we don't come back as angels. You know, highway to heaven, that's, that's not what happens. Okay? But... He says here, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And, and look at who those witnesses are. I mean, Noah. Elijah. All of these men that had gone before. All of these, these great and powerful, and not, not just men, women too. Because it talks about Sarah. Okay? And Rahab. The, the, these people are our witnesses. It says, since we are... Uh, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Now pay attention here. 
okay, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what is the joy that was set before him? Us. It's not, not that he's going to sit at the right hand of God, because that's where he started from. That's where he came from. So the joy that was set before him was having us reconciled to him, you and me. Now, look at that in context to what he's looking at here. He's saying, who for the joy that was set before him, that's me and you, he endured the cross. Now, flip back to Colossians chapter 2 real quick. I'll wrap up with this. I'm going to pick up in verse 13. And you, and, and specifically he's speaking to the church at Colossae, but by extension, because God knows all things, this is being spoken to us, okay? Who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made a lie together with him, having forgiven us uh, some of the little sins. <coughs> oh, thank God for that word, amen? amen. All <coughs> of our sins. All of our trespasses. But then look in 14. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. See, that's where our sin still is. Okay? He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Okay, folks, this is where we start. <coughs> this was God's plan from before day one. From before he spoke anything into existence, his plan was that his son would come. When the criteria were met, his son came. And he went with the sole purpose of exchanging his life for ours. Of taking his perfect, blameless, spotless, sinless life and attributing that to us. And taking upon himself all of our garbage. Every last ounce. We're, we're so peculiar, aren't we? Because... They're just some of our sins that we feel like, you know, he, he didn't die for. He didn't, we we kind of keep them close to us. God can never forgive me of this. He already has. Okay? The only one holding on to it is you because he's already let it go. He did that at the cross. Okay? This was the plan. This was the get-go. As Jesus is coming down uh, off from Mount Hermon, off from the Mount of Transfiguration, coming down, he comes around, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and he comes down through Samaria. As a matter of fact, he's going through Samaria when, um, again, James and John, uh, they came to a village in Samaria and the people would not receive Jesus. So what did James and John do? You want us to blast them? <laughs> we'll show them. <clears throat> okay. And he comes through Samaria. Now, now keep in mind, it was through Samaria that, that he went. That, that shocked everybody because a good Jew did not go through Samaria. And he actually went and he waited at a well. And a woman came up. And, and, and then Jesus violated all kinds of custom. Because you don't talk to a woman. And you especially don't talk to a Samaritan. And you really, really don't talk to a Samaritan woman. <laughs> and then salvation came to that village. Okay, so as he comes down through Samaria and he's headed to Jericho, he has got a single focus. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on because he's still going to teach, he's still going to do the miraculous, but his eyes are set, you know, um, in Isaiah. The, this passage that I read back in, in Luke that I asked you to keep your finger on 
Uh, it says he set his face. I believe that is, is, is a prophetic fulfillment of, of the writing of Isaiah where he said, I, I set my face as flint. I set it as stone. I'm holding fast to what I know to be true. And I believe that's what Jesus is doing. He set his gaze toward Jerusalem and his face was set. He was not going to be moved. Okay? Even when Peter says, hey, nobody, man, I'm here. Nobody's going to get you. Jesus, you've got to quit saying these things. You know, it's a real downer when you start talking about dying and stuff. I mean, look at James and John. Their thunder's fizzling. You've got to quit. Get behind me, Satan. Whoa! Wow, he just took it to a whole new level. Poor Peter. Thank God for Peter. Amen. That gives me a lot of hope. You know? <laughs> Father, we thank you that you moved everything according to your plan. Father, when you determine that such a thing is going to happen, it happens. We thank you, Father, that you have allowed us to be participants with you. That you have brought us through the cross, through that, that shed blood of Christ, that you have washed away all our sin. That, Father, when we stand before you, we stand before you righteous, but we stand before you as your children. We thank you. We thank you for the cross. And we thank you, Father, that that tomb is empty. That the victory has been won. We bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen.